morning, hello, welcome back. I'm Satori and we are playing the Wraith Space Industries run through of Kerbal Space Program. Why did I call it Wraith Space Industries? Because why would we name our agency something easy to pronounce? So today we have a special plan. Our orbital flight yesterday got us up to 85 science. Our next goal in buy-in, I've decided, is actually going to be fuel systems. And what fuel systems allows us is the largest of the, the small diameter fuel tank. It also gets us into the first of the larger fuel tanks, which we won't make use of until we get the larger boosters. But it also gets us this handy dandy part. So what the external fuel duct does is this allows us to route fuel between uh, fuel tanks while we're in flight. And it doesn't do it smartly, it's not an interactive routing. But what it allows us to do is actually set up a thing called asparagus staging. Asparagus staging is a really fantastic way to make very efficient rockets. So the second part of the episode will focus on uh, a quick tutorial on how to do asparagus staging to begin with. But if we're going to do that, this is going to take 90 science to buy in, which means we need to find uh, 4.7 science somewhere. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to cheese a little bit of science out of our space center. As I mentioned in a previous video, each of the separate zones in our space center counts as its own biome. So each of these can have its own set of scientific readings. And it's not going to get us a lot of science individually, but taking each of the measurements that we can do at each of those sites will eventually give us a nice little bump in science to make sure we can pick up some bits and pieces. And right now, we have not touched the runway at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into our space hangar. And we are going to build a quick and dirty science bot. So the first thing we'll need is we'll need a command center. This defaults to placing horizontal because the space hangar is a, a horizontal takeoff. We're going to rotate our command pod around. You can do this using the WASD keys so that we have a nice vertical alignment. And now we're just going to stick all of the bits and pieces on that we need to do some good science. So we're going to have to rotate this up so we have our materials bay. We're not flying, we're not doing anything, we don't need to worry about symmetry or balance, so we're just going to stick some mystery goo on there. We don't need parachutes, we do want a temperature gauge. And I believe that is all the science that we can do at the moment. We're going to drop this down to the ground, and we're going to put our trusty scientist, Bob Kerman, into the pilot seat. We are going to call this Science Cheese 1, because we like counting. It says we have no landing gear. That would be a problem, except that we're not going to move. All we're going to do is launch. We are going to log our temperature, so you can see temperature scan from the runway. And the temperature readings are quite literally nominal literally nominal. Hmm. We're going to observe our mystery goo. So <laughs> much the, the goo seems to behave very much the same as it always does around here. And we're going to observe our materials. And we're going to take a crew report. And all put together, we're now going to recover our craft. And for that very, very modest amount of effort, we just cheesed another 15 science. And Bob Kerman gained an XP. I don't know what for, but he did. So we'll celebrate that later. For now, we need to get back to Bob's department. Because we need to pick up our fuel systems. Now our next purchase, so I've been thinking about this as well, in order to take our science cheese to the next level, we're going to need wheels. And the easiest way to get wheels is from aviation. 
the other thing is we have contracts for VIP escorts that involve orbital and suborbital flights. We know we're capable of orbital and suborbital flights around Kerbin, but the problem is that we have no way to carry any VIPs. Right now we have a single command pod that holds one person. We could try to stack multiple command pods, but it's really a mess, it's structurally weak, and from the general construction science, we can actually get a crew cabin which carries two, which would be perfect, that's exactly what we need. So the decision we have to make is between aviation for the wheels and general construction once we cheese a little more science. Escorting VIPs will get us more money. Money will be important because we're going to upgrade buildings. But wheels will get us more cheesy science. Cheesy science means that we'll be able to unlock more things. And I believe we should be able to cheese enough science out of the Space Center that this is actually very easy. The other dilemma is if we cheese science now, we're going to want to repeat it later because we'll have more scientific measurements to make. Because as we established, the pressure, break, uh, pressure gauge is the next thing. And there are a couple of more scans after that that we will unlock. So ideally, I kind of want to save our cheese adventure until we have better equipment so we can do more scientific measurements. Largely because it's, it's cheesy, it's easy, but it's not quick. So the fewer times I can drive around the space, the space center, the better, I think. So I think our next goal will be to focus on getting the general construction so that we can get uh, more money for upgrading buildings. Now, speaking of which, our mission yesterday did actually get us over 300,000 uh, kerbucks. And those kerbucks, so we have upgraded to level two mission control, which was good because that got us more contracts. The vehicle assembly building is quickly going to become our next desirable upgrade. Um, what that'll do is, right now our max supported parts is 30 and we've already had to, to tinker with our rockets to stay below that. When we start getting into the next bits, which will involve flying to and orbiting around the moon, that is going to be really overly restrictive. The upgrade is expensive, but it's definitely worth it because you can see it almost, it, it multiplies the max parts by eight and a half. So we'll be able to do 255 supported parts. We also will be able to do basic action groups, but those we won't really get into until later on. Um, we might do a little bit of that to do quick measurements, um, but it's really it's a function that supports more of our later activities with more complex equipment. The other thing that we definitely want to keep an eye on is our astronaut complex, and the reason is, for a very cheap upgrade, we can perform EVAs. EVAs will allow us to do EVA reports, and it will allow us to collect data from our equipment while we're in flight. Um, bear in mind, not in atmosphere flight. In atmosphere flight means our Kerbal gets torn off our ship by the wind forces, but in space, our Kerbals can do EVAs, collect data from equipment like temperature gauges so that we can, we can collect multiple times with one temperature gauge instead of packing several. So that's one that we're going to want to get to. The decision we need to make now is this is definitely the upgrade that we want to do. If we were to do this now, we would have no money. We would not be able to, to build a rocket. We want to build a rocket. And nine, uh, 87,000 Kerbucks will definitely get us pretty far with a rocket. Now, as I hinted at earlier in this video, I'm looking forward to taking a little bit of a break from our usual Let's Play style to do something more tutorial. I'm hoping throughout this series that I can, I can interrupt the, the playthrough of the game and introduce more insight into how real rocket science works and how rocket science works in the game. The first tutorial that I wanted to do was basically around uh, simple rocket design. Now, some of the topics I'm going to touch on, I have to acknowledge, take on a great deal more relevance when we're dealing with heavy rockets and traveling for their distances. But I wanted to address just some basic designs, specifically around the takeoff procedure and around the, the delicate balance of how many engines to use, how many uh, arms to use on your rocket. The game gives you the ability to do symmetry, but we want to know when it's useful to have more side arms on your rocket and when you're really best suited by having a, a really minimal kind of design or a, you know, a single column design. 
In order to help with this process, I put together a handful of very simple rockets using the parts that we've unlocked so far in the game to illustrate some basic principles. I also put them side by side in the same takeoff pattern. Now the pattern we're going to follow is a very simple, safe procedure to reach space. We start at the launch pad, thrusting directly upwards. We're going to maintain a thrust to weight ratio of 1.75. Now this is important to note because regardless of what the rocket is, if you maintain a consistent thrust to weight ratio, provided the rockets are capable, that will keep your speed the same at a given altitude. Obviously, with more complex designs and more complex thrusters, this can vary a bit, and there can be more influences that require finer controls from the pilot. But for our immediate purposes, the rockets are very simple. Now we're going to thrust directly upwards until we reach 10 kilometers, at which point we'll begin our gravity turn. You can see the tracker in the bottom right is going to keep tabs on where we are in our maneuver. It is worth noting with a design like this, as I've pointed out before, when our aim differs sufficiently from our trajectory, we get more broad facing on the rocket. If you try to push this too fast with a, a longer face, that rocket can spin out of control, as you can see in the top right. This will be hugely wasteful, and it's not worth recovering from. If you have the ability, it's best at that point just to revert. Now, once we pass the 19 kilometer mark, mark, remember that the atmosphere is getting very, very thin at this point, and we can push our, our trajectory further and further. Ideally, we want to be aiming for about a 45 degree slant. That 45 degree slant means we're equally contributing to both vertical and horizontal thrust. The vertical thrust is primarily countering the downward pull of gravity while the horizontal thrust is what's going to get us into orbit. Orbit is achieved by going fast enough that we never quite get pulled down. So a nice way to think of it is, if you take a really super elastic bit of spandex, say, and put a bowling ball in the middle, it makes a, a giant cone. The cone of that wall gets deeper, uh, steeper and steeper as it gets down towards the bowling ball. If you were to take a tennis ball and try to throw it at a sufficient speed, along that edge, so long as it maintains that speed, it will continually circle and not fall in to reach the bowling ball. Obviously, if we have the spandex and the tennis ball, there's friction between the spandex and the tennis ball, there's wind resistance, and in general, it's going to lose energy and eventually fall in. We know that. In space, however, there's, sufficient, there's significantly less forces that will slow the rocket down. So for our immediate purposes, and for the sake of uh, Kerbal Space Program, if we get sufficient speed, we can maintain that orbit indefinitely. Now, once we reach, you notice that we stopped our thrust earlier in it, as soon as our apoapsis reached 75 kilometers. At that point, we kill the thrust because it's the most efficient time to thrust, full thruster at the apoapsis, to raise our periapsis on the other side of the planet. If we wanted to reach orbit, we would need to get that, uh, that periapsis to meet our apoapsis at least 70 kilometers, probably higher. For the purposes of this test, not all of the rockets are going to be capable of that, but we'll keep track of the final velocity that we have, because at the end of this burn, we will have our fastest velocity, provided we do not have a periapsis on the far side of the planet that is below that 75 kilometer mark. Now, we'll also track the final periapsis height, or the apoapsis height, if it becomes higher, as that value will give us an, effect, an idea of just how far our fuel really went. Now, as you can see with the simple rocket, that got us to a final height and a final velocity, and we'll talk more about that in the next session. We're going to start with a simple rocket, which is a simple stack of fuel pods and a single engine. It gives us an initial thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, and the second value that we're going to keep an eye on is the delta V. That's the, uh, an assessment of how far the fuel will get us using these engines. The ASL is the atmospheric value, the VAC is the vacuum value. The second design will split two of the smaller fuel pods off and attach two additional engines. When those smaller fuel pods are exhausted, which will happen first, those side pods will be ejected, removing some of that weight. You can see our initial thrust to weight ratio is more than doubled 
but we trade some of our delta V value, and you can see that the cost of the rocket is actually now doubled. Third, we're going to split off two pairs of fuel pods so that now the side stages are closer in proportion to the main stage. Again, we have the same thrust to weight ratio because we still have three engines, and the cost is still doubled. But now we've traded a little bit more of our delta V values, and we'll see what that effect gets us. Finally, we're going to do a quad stage rocket. This takes those four fuel pods and puts them onto four separate engines and four side pods. Because none of them are interconnected, they'll all run out at the same time and all be ejected at the same time. Now you can see our thrust to weight ratio has jumped up yet again, as has our cost, and we traded only a little bit of delta V value to get there. As we start our first test launch, I want to highlight something important. We cannot under underestimate the significance of piloting precision, which is to say, even following the same plan in terms of target values, every flight will have little nuances that vary. In this case, as an example, I launched the simple rocket a few times in preparation and got final periapsis values between negative 40 and negative 60 kilometers. There is a popular add-on called MechJet that automates piloting procedures and can even that out, but for me, that really crosses the line into cheapening the game experience. I like that I need to execute my launch well to get the most delta V for my further activities. I also understand completely that as you launch rocket after rocket, that part gets to be a bit repetitive. And so I understand why people would want to automate that portion of the process. Now, at the top of their flight, each of these designs will fire 10 seconds shy from their apoapsis time. At the top of their flight, each of these designs will fire 10 seconds shy of the apoapsis time. They'll burn the remainder of their fuel reaching full orbit, and they'll aim at the horizon, compensating up or down slightly to maintain their apoapsis height and we'll take a final measure of their accomplishments by measuring two key values, their orbital speed and their periapsis height. Or rather than periapsis height, it may be best to describe it as the height of their orbit on the opposite side of the planet from their takeoff apoapsis. This value will be negative when the rocket fails to achieve orbit or near orbit, and technically, if the value exceeds 75 kilometers, it is our orbit's new apoapsis. Now, as expected, based on our predicted delta Vs, our quad rocket is the slowest and lowest of our simple rockets. The fastest and closest to reaching orbit is the simple rocket. Really, this is not a fair comparison, however, as we've added excessive thrust potential, but we've backed off to maintain a consistent thrust to weight ratio on all of our rockets. As we established, the engines are at their most efficient when they are full throttle, so the more engines we have, the less efficient we're being with them. Now I'd like to introduce the concept of asparagus. Not the vegetable, but rather the fuel staging design that was named after asparagus for a similar visual appearance. The concept works by connecting fuel pods in sequence using fuel ducts such that each pod on the interior remains full while the exterior is depleted and then ejected. Now while designs can be more complicated, involving up to infinite sequential spiral arms, or uh, nested versions where multiple tanks will feed into larger core tanks before eventually feeding into the primary rocket. The core concept is simple and will be the same in all of the designs. In a simple rocket, as the fuel is depleted from the top to the bottom, there's an empty space left behind. That empty space is metal, it's weight, that the rocket then has to continue to carry. A side pod design does allow us to separate off part of that canister so we can discard it when it's spent. However, these side pods now feed their own engine, which increases the cost of the total rocket substantially. Furthermore, because the primary rocket that will remain has also been burning from the beginning, without its fuel being replaced, it will still be lugging dead weight when we eject the side pods. The only value in adding additional engines to a rocket is to increase the thrust to weight ratio to support heavier rockets. On a simple design like this, we're actually reducing our efficiency because we'll still maintain a low TWR to limit our speed while pushing through the atmosphere. And limiting our TWR with more engines means reducing the throttle, and as I previously mentioned, the engines are most efficient at full throttle. Asparagus, in addition to improving the weight hauling efficiency, serves a purpose similar to the gears on a bicycle. To start a stationary rocket, we'll need more oomph than when the rocket is moving. Additionally, once we're moving out of the atmospheric resistance and farther from the gravity source, in this case Kerbin, our delta V will have a more dramatic effect per unit. 
We'll see that in a little more detail later on. For our next comparison, we're going to take the two designs with dual side pods, and we're going to introduce fuel lines. Now while this isn't technically asparagus, it does demonstrate the purpose and it shows you what you can accomplish in terms of efficiency by just introducing fuel lines. Now let's take a look at how our next set of test rockets compare side by side. First, you'll notice that the fuel lines add a very small amount of weight and cost, and reduce the thrust to weight ratio very slightly. In return, we do gain some delta V, but the improvement is very slight. This is because all three engines are now effectively burning through these small side pods first, so they'll burn out pretty quickly. With the second design, the side pods are much closer in proportion to the primary pod. When these weren't linked, the side pods would burn off only slightly ahead of the primary section, which means functionally, we are just tripling our burn rate and our dead weight generation. Now, we can see that for the same weight and proportional thrust alterations, we see a much more pronounced increase in delta V. As we move into launching our test rockets, the first thing to keep your eye on is when we detach our side pods. The fuel links make it so that all three engines are burning through the side pods first, rather than each burning through their own pod only. Mathematically, in this case, that means that the side pods are being consumed roughly 50% faster. This has two implications. First, we won't haul that extra weight as long. But second, we also won't have the thrust of three boosters as long. When you're designing your rocket, you'll want to make sure that you don't end up with a thrust to weight ratio of less than one when you eject those additional engines. Otherwise, unless you've already hit NAPWAPs as far above the atmosphere at 70 kilometers, you may stall and your rocket will never make it to space. Plans on a thrust to weight ratio are largely based on overcoming gravity, which is our principal concern when we're focusing purely on vertical thrust. As we tilt our rocket, we are now only using a portion of our thrust to counter gravity, and using more and more of it to increase our radial velocity. Once we're in space in a stable orbit, we're no longer concerned with overcoming gravity. At this point, we can and will use smaller thrust to weight ratios, as these will often accompany more vacuum efficient boosters, and eventually ion engines. Of course, these small thrust values will mean that we have to make longer burns, and these will have their own risks that we'll see in a later episode. The abstract concept of delta V may be a little ambiguous at first. I trust that the orbital velocity and altitude values are not. Particularly notice the substantial improvement of the fuel-linked medium stage rocket in the bottom right. In final measurement, though, the smaller side pods still performed better, and the introduction of fuel lines was approaching enough to put that rocket into a stable orbit. For our next illustration, I want to bring back our simple rocket for comparison. Remember, as this rocket burns, it will leave empty fuel pod space opening from the top down. This empty space is dead weight to carry. Our quad side pod rocket uses the same amount of fuel, but has pulled half of the total amount to support four additional engines. When we introduce fuel lines, those four side pods will now work in a sequence of pairs, representing our first true, albeit small, asparagus design. Again, we have traded a small increase in cost and weight, along with a reduction in the thrust to weight ratio for a substantial increase in delta V. Again, observe how the asparagus pods will eject faster, and how they will now eject in a sequence of balanced pairs. It is very important, particularly as your design gets more involved, that you shed these used up parts in such a way that your rocket remains balanced at each stage. The best way to accomplish this is in the vehicle assembly building, using the center of mass and center of thrust indicators. At each stage, you want your center of thrust to be directly in a vertical line with your center of mass, or your rocket will spin out of control. Or at least, it will require constant steering to not spin out, provided the imbalance is subtle enough that you can actually correct it with the tools your rocket has equipped. As I've emphasized earlier, these test rockets fail to demonstrate the main reason why you would want more engines, namely, to lift a heavier load. As you can see, we've already shed our side pods, and because we've maintained matching thrust to weight ratios to this point, as best we can, there isn't a significant difference in speed or altitude. When you're leveraging additional thrust, you'll want to design your stages to heft your weight above your gravity turn at least. Personally, I like to design a quad arm structure like this to release the pods we would tip over first, as it creates a cleaner gimbal control for the rockets in line with our primary body from this camera angle create increasingly complex sequences of boosters, but I've found six side pods seems to top out among my most efficient designs before I have to upgrade the side pods to bigger engines. A set of three pairs does make for a small but fun design challenge in balancing the rocket as each pair is released. Or rather, the balance itself isn't as challenging as the minor tweaks required to maintain simple control as we release the pods.
We'll definitely see this in later episodes. To the end of this test, we see that, as expected, the unsequenced quad is definitely spent first. But notice how just introducing fuel lines brought our five-engine beast a huge step back towards our simple rocket. The efficiency gains are so significant that should we be trying to haul a heavier weight, having five times the thrust could conceivably be done with smaller engines and without completely destroying our efficiency. For the final test, I wanted to take it to the next level in one big respect. None of our little test rockets were strong enough to make it to orbit, so let's push it further. Now, I did go for a bit of overkill, more than doubling our total fuel, but it is worth noting here that our total cost is still less than the two-stage quad design rocket. All of this additional fuel has gotten us a massive jump in delta V, and you see that our maximum initial thrust to weight ratio is actually now right at the target we'd shoot for on takeoff. That means that we can keep the throttle full open. This is a design feature that we'll actually aim for with our, our non-test rockets in the future. As we watch this final test play out, let's summarize some key points from the tutorial. First, rocket design is crucial to having enough resources to go where you need to go and do what you need to do, but piloting can waste those resources or make the most of them. So aim to do your best while piloting, but design with the expectation that things won't go perfectly. Especially late in the game, you can scrap hours of work reverting a rocket that fell short in the final stages of a mission. Or, if you don't revert in your game, you can need a whole new mission to rescue the Kerbals from the first mission. Second, when used well, fuel lines can significantly improve the efficiency of your rocket. But, make sure that your design does not end up with insufficient thrust halfway through your ascent. Check your thrust to weight ratios and the alignment of your center of mass and center of thrust with each stage of your rocket when creating more complex designs. Finally, setting target thrust to weight ratios and being able to maintain them during takeoff can help you keep your rocket below critical speeds to optimize your ascent through the atmosphere. I recommend starting off with a ratio of about 1.7 to 1.9, well below 10 kilometers, and not exceeding 3, uh, below 50 kilometers. Once you're above the atmosphere, your liquid fuel engines are most efficient at full throttle, but throttle control can still be very helpful for making fine adjustments. As you can see, our non-fuel linked rocket had more than enough oomph to brute force its way into orbit. And in fact, that altitude is not a typo. We have reached a new apoapsis height of 7,000 kilometers, that's 7 million meters. Our fuel linked version eked out 800 more meters per second in orbital velocity, which is enough to escape from Kerbin's sphere of influence and establish an orbit around the star, Kerbal. Thank you for watching. I hope you found the tutorial helpful. If you liked the video, like it. If you want to hear more, uh, please hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends.